One in three people who break their hip will be dead within one year, and after 10 years, only 8.5% will be alive, compared to 39.8% in the general population. Those numbers are terrifying, and when I was an orthopedic resident where I assisted in hip operations, I could see why the post-surgery death rate was so high. These patients generally had incredibly weak bones, and the hip fracture is just a marker of frailty. We were the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. The build-up to a hip fracture is decades in the making, and the trouble begins much earlier than most people realize. But the good news is that we can do something about it now to prevent problems later. And the earlier we start, the better. And if you want weekly health research summaries and health strategies that I share with my patients, sign up using the link in the pinned comment. So why does bone loss happen in the first place and who's at risk? Bone is a living, dynamic tissue and throughout life, there's a continuous process of bone being reconstructed. This happens as old bone is removed and replaced with new bone. It's like a road that's constantly having sections torn up and repaired. And when we're younger, this process is in balance. It maintains bone mass and strength, but as we age, that bone starts to break down more quickly than it's replaced, and as a result, our bones get weaker. But when does this decline in bone quality begin? Well, the shocking answer is that it's much earlier than most of us assume. As we're growing throughout our childhood and teenage years, our bones are growing as well, and they're increasing in size and strength, but at some point, that growth stops. That's when we'll reach the peak amount of bone mass that we'll ever have, and this usually happens sometime in our 20s. It's typically a bit earlier in women for men. And after that peak, things start to go downhill. It's very slow initially, but by around age 40 or so, things really start to accelerate. Bone loss doesn't necessarily mean that our bones are shrinking, instead it's usually talking about the bone structure that's thinning out. It loses the density of minerals that give it strength. It's a bit like termites eating away at wood beams supporting a house. The beams are still the same size, but they become full of holes that greatly reduce their strength. So how much loss are we talking about? Well, the answer is going to be different for men and women. Unfortunately, after women go through menopause, the bone loss accelerates. Because of hormonal changes in their bodies, they experience accelerated bone loss at a rate of 3 to 5% per year for several years. So you can see that over a lifetime, the loss of bone mass and strength is a big deal. And with an aging population, many of us are at risk. It's estimated that around 200 million people worldwide have osteoporosis. That's when the bones have thinned out enough to present a significant risk of fracturing. For people over the age of 65 in the US, 27% of women and about 6% of men have osteoporosis. And it's easy to think, well, I'm younger, so I don't have to worry about this yet. But what we do when we're young plays a massive role in our risks later, which we'll see in a minute. But before I come to that, I want to emphasize why this matters so much. When our bones get too weak, we greatly increase the risk of breaking them. And as I said at the beginning of this video, those who get fractures when they're older face serious problems. They lose their independence and mobility. Only around half of those who fracture their hip bone, for instance, recover their ability to live as they did before the fracture. And overall health declines rapidly after a fracture. The statistics on mortality that I've already shared are alarming. Fortunately, we do have ways to lower our risks and we want to start as soon as possible. After I explain how, we're going to have a look at some new recommendations for preventing fractures from the US Preventative Services Task Force. As I already mentioned, bone is a living, dynamic tissue, and just as other tissues in our body, this means that it responds to our environment. So even though bone density loss is a natural process that occurs as we age, it doesn't have to happen at the same rate in all of us. There are things that we can do now to affect its rate of change, and the most important is exercise, but the type of exercise really matters, and to understand why, it would be helpful to first see why exercise helps. So it's similar to how exercise relates to muscle mass. Our bodies are super efficient, and it's not going to keep or build extra muscle mass when it's not needed. But when we exercise, we strain our muscles, we create minor damage, and the body responds by repairing that damage and strengthening the tissue, adjusting to the greater demands that our activities are wanting. Something similar happens with our bones. If we aren't putting as much strain on them, the signals to the specialized cells that make new bone decrease in their activity. At the same time, it signals that the cells that break down bone can become more active. So when we exercise, we put more stress on our bones and the reverse happens. But how big of a difference can we actually make with exercise alone? Well, let's have a look at this example. One clinical trial examined the impact of exercise on bone of the lower spine and bones of the lower leg. After a 20-week exercise program, researchers measured substantial improvements in the structural quality of trabecular bone. An earlier meta-analysis concluded that exercise could prevent or reverse nearly 1% of bone loss per year in women. 
That is hugely significant, especially when you consider the lifetime bone loss that we looked at earlier. You can see that exercise has got the potential to help maintain bone health as we age. But what type of exercise should we be doing to get the biggest impact? Well, here's where things do get a little bit complicated, but stick with me. There have been tons of studies of exercise as ways to prevent osteoporosis and fractures, but the results, they haven't been consistent. A big part of the problem is that exercise protocols, they are different in the different studies. At this point, though, we are getting some clarity about what types of exercise are important. One thing is to apply a relatively high load to our bones. So load comes in two forms. There are external loads, so this would be like shocks to the leg as we're running, and there are internal loads. This is what your bone experiences when you lift a weight. So subjecting our bones to both kinds of loads appears to work best. So that means that running, jumping exercises, and resistance training are all critical. The key idea to remember is this, if we're trying to push our bones a bit beyond what they're used to bearing, this is what stimulates the body to respond and make them stronger. And as a bonus, we'll of course develop muscle strength and improve our balance. And these will decrease our chances of falling in the first place, reducing our odds of getting a fracture. Now my patients at the clinic, they often ask about calcium, as it's a crucial ingredient in bone structure. So should we be taking calcium supplements? Well the evidence here is quite mixed when it comes to whether this helps to reduce fracture risk. One meta-analysis found that several studies reported reduced fracture risks with calcium supplements. Yet many of the individual studies had significant risks of bias, so when they isolated just randomized controlled trials with the lowest risk of bias, the story was different. Calcium supplements didn't seem to help at all. There were even some risks with taking too much calcium. There is a small place for supplements though, which I'll go through now and then we'll have a look at the new US Preventative Services Task Force guidelines for other strategies to help us keep our bones strong. So personally, I take vitamin K2, vitamin D and magnesium as part of microvitamin to support my bone strength. Vitamin D3 helps to ensure that the calcium that I get in my food is absorbed into my body and vitamin K2 helps to direct that calcium to my bones. And magnesium supports bone formation in several ways, so they all work together. But just because I take a supplement does not in any way mean that you should as well. It is important to stress, however, that the role of supplements is limited. Exercise is the key thing. It's what stimulates our body to maintain our bone strength. And if exercise is something that we can do to strengthen our bones, it's worth mentioning two things that we absolutely shouldn't do. Both smoking and excessive alcohol are risk factors for osteoporosis. But here's one of the things that makes osteoporosis so challenging. It's a silent problem. Most people only discover the issue when they fall and have a fracture. So is there a way to spot risks earlier? Well, the good news is that there is. We've developed a screening technique to directly measure bone health, giving us a gauge of fracture risk. The most common is a DEXA scan. It uses x-rays to measure bone mineral density. And clinicians will also look at other factors like age and sex to develop a more complete picture of our risk. So should we all be going out to get screened with a DEXA scan? Well, without a nuanced holistic approach, the automatic answer that springs to mind is yes. But the US Preventative Services Task Force looked at all of the evidence and they came to a different answer. And based on the studies that we have right now, for some groups, the evidence is insufficient to assess the balance of benefits and harms and they call for more research. So let's dive into these recommendations. For women over the age of 65, screening with a DEXA scan makes sense. The second group where DEXA scans should be done is for women under 65 who have gone through menopause and are assessed to be at increased risk. For example, if a woman has type 2 diabetes or low body weight or a family history of hip fractures or smokes cigarettes or drinks alcohol, all of those increase that person's risk of a fracture and they should undergo screening. The screening can catch weakened bones earlier so that preventative treatment can begin and I'll talk about extra tools in addition to diet and exercise shortly. When it comes to older high-risk women, one meta-analysis found that screening was associated with a 17% lower risk of hip fractures. So what about for men? Well, the task force concluded that we don't have the evidence needed right now to give a clear recommendation. They say that the decision to screening should be made in consultation with a doctor based on the individual's risk profile. So what's the next step if screening reveals a problem? Well, the most common approach, in addition to diet and exercise, is to initiate a treatment with a class of medication called bisphosphonates. They work by slowing down the process that breaks down our bones. And these medications do have a pronounced impact on our risks. One meta-analysis found that bisphosphonates reduced hip fracture risk over a 24 to 48 month period by about 35%. At the same time, these medications, they do have some risks. 
So people who take them for longer periods of time, they can experience unusual fractures and problems with the jaw that are resistant to healing. These adverse effects are rare, but they are serious. And that's why doctors and patients need to come together to discuss the potential benefits and risks. Because our screening tools and eventual treatments, they aren't perfect. We have to balance the risks versus benefits. And for men who aren't at high risk, the task force did not find enough evidence to justify that the benefits do outweigh the risks and they call for more research to be done. But I want to come back to the topic of calcium because I've found that so many patients at the clinic, they are taking calcium supplements. And in this next video here, I want to explain the risks with calcium supplements that most people have never heard of to make sure that we are using them correctly.